This episode is brought to you in association with Janice Henderson Investors. It is a marketing communication, not for onward distribution, and the value of an investment can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Past performance does not predict future returns, and nothing in this episode should be construed as advice. Our discussion is for illustrative purposes only. References made to individual securities does not constitute a recommendation to buy, sell or hold any security, investment strategy or market sector, and should not be assumed to be profitable. Janus Henderson Investors, its affiliated advisor or its employees may have a position in the securities mentioned, not for distribution in European Union member countries. My name is Andrew Chiguri. Today, I'm joined by Ben Lofthouse, Portfolio Manager of Henderson International Income Trust. Today, we'll be talking about how he's approaching 2023, dividend sustainability during a period of low growth, the current economic cycle, and how this is impacting investors. We'll also be talking about the benefits of diversification in an uncertain environment. Ben, welcome. So Ben, investors seem cautiously optimistic as 2023 gets underway. Inflation is peaking. The recession might not be as deep and prolonged as previously forecast. And, you know, China's reopening should boost global growth. How are you navigating the market at the moment? Well, well, firstly, it's, you know, these are very welcome developments. The outlook was very tough mid last year with a lot of events which hadn't been predicted and very high inflation and slowing growth. The foot has been taken off the throat of the economy a bit with this energy price falling and then China reopening. For us, we haven't had to change very much because, you know, we've I guess, stayed invested where we were invested. What we've seen is a number of the companies, we've got a large weight in Europe, over 30% of mm. the portfolio. We actually added some stocks into Europe last year on the cyclical side. So you know, we've benefited from that recovery. And we also added a little bit of Asia and China last year. So actually, the rally since last year has been good for the portfolio. So despite the volatility, it's been an okay period. You mentioned there that you've added to cyclical areas of the market but one area that we've seen that perform was value did quite well last year and current conditions would imply that you know it might continue to outperform have you been adding or increasing your exposure to value as well we're quite a value orientated fund the things we look for are companies that are market leading or industry leading in their fields trading at valuations that we think are too low for the returns they produce and the outlook that for the last seven years potentially has been an unloved area of the market You know, we've had six to eight months, perhaps a year of better performance from those areas. Looking at previous trends, and it's always hard to extrapolate from those, the valuation of value is still low versus other parts of the market. And so there's no reason why that couldn't appreciate over the future. I think it's very interesting to think about why value has underperformed. And perhaps Mm. we can touch on that in a different question, because I think that's maybe easier than just saying it should outperform. Looking at the other side of that, you know, to some, the growthier end of the segment that kind of sold off now appear attractive. Are you starting to look at growthier segments as well? Like what do you need to see to start investing in some of the techier stocks, for example? At the moment, one of the problems, it's very hard to see the true trend within industries because of COVID and the recovery and the stimulus that was applied in that period and the volatility of company results. A long way of saying you know, I don't think it's clear about what is value and what is growth. Mm. I think what you're what you're seeing at the moment is that the so-called value parts of the market are generating better growth. And that is uncomfortable for some people. And it's uncomfortable even in society. So oil companies and banks are making much more money in this environment with higher inflation and a scarcity of resources around oil and gas than they have been for the past decade so not even due to covid and because we haven't seen a recovery in those areas for so long people are not ascribing a higher valuation to them so these companies are re-rating with the earnings going up and things like dividend yields on these areas might have been five six seven percent and you would have looked at the said ben that is unsustainable but now because the earnings are going up those dividends have become sustainable and they started growing again so I think it's hard to say there's going to be a new oil growth cycle or a new bank cycle that is all about growth. And what we're going through at the moment is just actually reappraising the fact that they're much more profitable than we thought they were. On the flip side, I don't think we fully know where the profitability within the technology areas and areas that benefited 
during COVID really is either. So we saw an incredible period where all of our spending went towards online marketplaces. We couldn't go on holiday. And then corporates who hadn't had a transition plan to maybe take them through to a technologically advanced future, you know, yeah. if you were a brick and mortar retailer, if you were a company that previously relied on relationships and sales teams to go out and do it, suddenly found you had to pivot very aggressively towards yeah. a digital infrastructure. And so I think people don't quite know what that run rate looks like either. We had this kind of sugar high of uh, software investment and technology investment. And now that's coming back, but we don't quite know what the run rate is. So I think this idea coming out of this is we will get a better idea of where the real growth areas are in the future and where the areas that are really challenged are. I don't think we've finished that process. So in the portfolio, we have still been reducing technology stocks. We have a more value end of technology stocks. So the stocks mm. that have done well for us are things like Broadcom and Cisco. And in some cases, they didn't do so well in COVID because actually Cisco has got a lot of on-premise server services. Right. If you, Even if you wanted to increase your on-premise facilities, you couldn't. So actually, they're seeing better growth. So I'm not too worried about them because they're almost benefiting from COVID opening up. Yeah. Where we're a bit more worried are things like semiconductors. So Texas Instruments that is making really, really high profits because you couldn't get semiconductor chip for love nor money is making much higher profits maybe on some areas than it should have been. Long term, it might probably be still a leader, but we've been taking profits there. Mm. And then we've been looking in some other areas where perhaps, you know, they haven't benefited. So we're still in this process of finding out where the real trends in society are and then digesting particularly some of the green transition areas that have been emerged as a, a focus post the last two years. You touched on banking dividends and also dividends from oil and gas as well, which led the market last year. At the moment now we're seeing, you know, a lot of margin pressure because of higher input costs across the board. How sustainable are some of the current payouts that, you know, that we saw last year? I think on the face of it, they're as sustainable as I've ever been in my career. And the reason I say that is because actually 2020 was somewhat of a clearing event. If you had been a firm that had stuck to a dividend through thick and thin, even if plans hadn't quite gone your way. So, you know, the oil fields that you'd invested in had cost you more. The telecommunication networks that you invested in had not made you as much money as you thought. What you've seen in the last two years is they've all rebased. And on the flip side, the financial system post the GFC in 2007-8 for the European economy and, and the UK included in that, it took a long time for regulators to signal that they felt the financial system was really robust. So we had a kind of creeping regulatory increase in capital requirements. And now we've seen a period actually where we've come through this last two years with high capital ratios, low losses, and banks have been given the green light to return capital. So actually, you know, these big areas, and then there's areas like pharmaceuticals, consumer staples, actually, which are just not very variable. And they're not making unsustainable margins and they're just plodding along doing their thing. Where perhaps we're seeing more volatility is somewhere like mining and materials sector. So they've moved to these variable payouts. So just today we had BHP reporting, you know, a much lower dividend year on year. But that's not going to necessarily affect the share price because we know the dividend is going to be variable now. And you touched on, you know, thematics. And I'd just like to come back to that a little bit more. I mean, traditionally, financials, miners and oil and gas have been, you know, dividend staples. Where else are you finding dividends at the moment? Are you tapping into some of the thematic trends such as electrification, for example? I think the key trend I would say over the last three years outside of inflation and the war, you know, putting aside those two big ones, <laughs> That the key trend, I think, is technology use and adoption broadening out across more areas of economies. What do I mean by that? So if we're going to replace carbon molecules with electrons, which is effectively what the transition means, there's no suggestion of any of us using less energy. Like no one is very politically unpalatable for the idea of us all to turn off our lights during the day. And when we thought it was going to go that way last year, everyone was very nervous. And what it really means is they want you and I to use more electricity from clean sources. So that requires really big investment in the utilities, the generation of energy. Much of it is domestic. So previously, when you outsourced those carbon generation molecules, you might have a new field in Angola mm. or a new field in Kazakhstan. And that was where the investment went in. Now we're seeing actually large wind farms and solar panels being built across the US, across the UK. 
and that has to be plugged into the grid seeing our home life being changed a bit on that as well so there's quite a lot of investment there if we look at say, the industrial space we're seeing they're benefiting from that because there's quite a lot of technology that's industrial technology that gets used in that process i guess the other thing that we're seeing you know in the industrial area is you know companies taking things like virtual models of pieces of equipment that are running so actually you know you can do a virtual piece of equipment with sensors so you can see when it's getting hot in a certain place you still need to send the person out to that site to fix it but you're going to know the problem before they go there that way you can make it more efficient you can go there less and you can also go there when it's needed so there's a lot of data use and i think going back to the one of your questions earlier you know there's a lot of technological adoption still going on um, and we're not worried about that. It's just that some of it might have been pulled through. So, yeah, a bit of a rambling answer, but quite an exciting period of technological adoption going on across large swathes of sectors. From a macro perspective, we seem to be rolling in and out of recessions and recoveries, and that's creating a lot of uncertainty at the moment. How is this impacting the market? And also, how are you taking this into account from a stock selection or positioning perspective? So I think actually the rolling recessions and recoveries are actually within sectors of companies. If you're a company that was serving the mining and oil sector, you've had a terrible four or five years. And then if you were doing data centers and PC, you know, or kind of technology hardware, you've mm. had a great time. If you're a, a company that fed into both of those, you could see one of your divisions having a terrible time and one of them having a great time. Same in pharmaceuticals, you know, you, you saw a period where we saw a massive increase in testing mm. and a massive period of strong growth for vaccines if you're in that area. And then meanwhile, if you'd been in cancer delivery in terms of you know delivering kind of solutions for people to treat cancer, mm. those appointments fell a lot. Or if you were doing dental implants, that revenue fell during that period. So through this period, we've seen quite big swings. And if you're in a large company that's diversified, you haven't really seen it very much. So those have been mm -hmm. our best performers. Kind of large diversified companies have gone through last year pretty much share price wise unscathed. If you were exposed to a specific vertical, it feels really, really tough. I don't know if we're going to get a period where it's synchronized on the recovery side. I think that's what we're, we don't know. At the moment, we've got China opening up and it was very closed, but we've got much higher interest rates in the US. So we've probably got a bit of slowing in the US opening up in China. I think we've got different cycles there that are coming through at the moment. And that's how we've positioned the portfolio is to try and you know, have a good exposure to lots of different parts of these cycles across different sectors and regions. Is that the key difference you would say for this economic cycle in terms of where monetary policy is and where inflation is as well? Is that the key difference at the moment? I think it's one of the key differences is that it hasn't been you know, the recession that we had a few years ago effectively with covid was not triggered by interest rates so quite normally when you look back at things gradually kind of the choking off of economic growth by interest rates going up at the end of a cycle often causes it to tip over in this case we just had this big external event that suddenly stopped everything to a much greater extent than interest rates normally would mm -hmm. and then various things recovered and we had this enormous stimulus so it's been a very hard period for people to extract the trends from and some industries were not able to produce things even though they had capacity and that i think you know is different normally we we get over capacity coming in an economic slowdown and that causes inflation to fall we've had a period now because of supply shortages and stuff where we had excess capacity in some areas but you couldn't use it or you couldn't get access to it so yeah. we had inflation building i think that is unusual you mentioned China there and China's reopening should boost global growth over the year and potentially offset recessionary pressures. Have you been increasing your exposure to domestic Chinese names at all? We have a bit over the last year, yes. We increased the exposure slightly last year to some of the direct Chinese names. We've got about 10 or 12 percent in kind of China and Hong Kong. We'd been hopeful there's a reopening situation there. It took longer than we thought and it's come quicker than we thought. It took much longer to happen and then when it happened it's been much much quicker than we thought. We didn't think they'd abandon COVID restrictions so quickly. What we've seen in other societies is we've all underestimated how quickly things normalize after opening up. Mm. So I think often we've tried to guess what the impact on human behavior will be about COVID and how it'll make us all nervous about things and maybe might not do as many things as we did before. I think what we've seen is things like travel comes back very quickly spending comes back more quickly than we thought it's kind of an element of revenge spending the uh, term being coined 
think we'll see similar things from this within the Chinese opening up. Looking at Asia as a region, countries within that region seem better positioned compared to Europe, for example, to navigate this environment. They've got lower interest rates and inflation, but also going to be experiencing higher growth. How are you investing within that region at the moment? I mean, you spoke on China. Are you increasing exposure to other countries within there? What we're looking for are individual companies where the potential is underappreciated. And so for us, it's less about the region you invest in and the companies that you invest in. We've seen some things like We've sold out of things like Nintendo, where we've owned it for a while, and where they, they saw quite a big benefit from COVID, but where we hoped that they would be able to extrapolate that benefit more with a change in their business model. And that hasn't come through as strong as we thought. At the same time, we've switched that into Sony, where actually you know, a market like Japan is trading at a cheap valuation versus history and isn't seeing quite as much of the inflation or interest rate changes than other economies are seeing. In the last year, we did see some areas get too expensive in 2021. Um, and we've seen some of those areas come back. So actually, we've found ourselves buying back a little bit into consumer staples. So companies like Perno and Ambev, where they're emerging market focused, and they've underperformed for a while, interesting opportunities for us. Well, I'd say more company specific than necessarily trying to kind of second guess a you know, what's going to happen for a region. And one of the key pillars of the trust is diversification, you know, which was pretty difficult and didn't really work at all last year. Most regions and sectors sold off except for energy, of course. You know, given that backdrop, why should investors be diversified now? I saw your question that and I'm, I'm <laughs> going gonna, gonna to take you up on that. I disagree. I think last year was the perfect example of diversification. Henderson International Trust ended up with net asset value that in the end was higher than it started at, as we stand now, and they're still at a low valuation. So actually last year, if you'd been in pharmaceutical companies, large cap staples companies, our strategy last year was to try and find companies that had pricing power and that were not exposed to the fall in price to earnings ratios that often come when interest rates go up. And that worked really well. So actually what you saw was a really big collapse in expensive tech, i.e. the companies that fall when interest rates go up because the valuations are too high. And then we also saw that companies like Coca-Cola and Mondelez and Merck, the pharmaceutical company, they got through massive price rises in line with inflation. So they ended up the year with higher earnings or at least in line earnings. And so actually the kind of icing on the cake to it was the financial sector and the, the industrial sector coming back at the end of the year. So I think where you're right in saying it was a volatile year, but actually, you were able to diversify yourself and there was a big distinction between companies whose earnings fell a lot and those whose yeah. earnings kind of held up. And that benefited us much better. We saw much more benefit of diversification last year than we did in 2020. So in 2020, when the market fell on COVID, there was very few places to avoid the drawdown. And we saw consumer staples companies and utilities companies being hit you know, almost as much as technology companies, industrial companies. Mm. This time around, we saw a much more nuanced kind of environment. So yeah, there we go. Okay, stand corrected on that one. Finally, what is the outlook for dividends in the coming months? Well, so far it looks very good. Last year, we had consistently increased our dividend forecast and actually the trust did increase its dividend 15% in around October time. I think the growth is going to moderate. So last year we saw maybe, you know, across the market, significant dividend growth because of the recovery in areas like oil and financials. I think this year, because earnings growth isn't going to be as strong, we will see growth moderate to more dividend growth in more than 5 to 7%. So far, we're being positively surprised again. So we've seen special dividends within the portfolio recently from Volvo Trucks. You know, that's an industry where it's quite consolidated and they've got an order book that runs out through to the end of this year. Because again, if you weren't on the order book, you couldn't buy a truck. We saw Total pay a special dividend. That's an oil company that we weren't expecting. So yeah, we're seeing a bit better growth than we'd expect, given the kind of macroeconomic narrative in large cap companies that don't have too much gearing. I think the thing to be cautious of are companies that have got leverage or gearing. I think we're seeing a much higher cost on refinancing of debt. You know, I don't want to be blasé about that. And I think for anyone listening. It's going to take a while for the interest rate cost impact to become apparent to mm. both consumers and corporates. And it's going to nibble away at earnings over the next few years because 
you know, in many cases, these companies financed sub 1% in Europe. In the UK, in some cases, you know, around 2%. And that figure is now more like 5 6%. It's going to be a big jump. The longer it stays here, the more impact that's going to have. Great. That's all we have time for. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Great. Thanks for your time. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with anyone you think will also find this interesting. If you want to learn more about investment trusts, we have a wealth of information available on our website, which you can find in the show notes. Important information, not for onward distribution. Before investing in an investment trust referred to in this podcast, you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved. You may wish to consult a financial advisor. This is a marketing communication. Please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and the annual reports of the AIF before making any final investment decisions. Past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend upon an investor's particular circumstances and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this podcast is intended to or should be construed as advice. This podcast is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection to improve customer service and for the regulated record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Janus Senderson Investors. Janus Senderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services are provided by Janus Senderson Investors International Limited. Reg number 3594615. Janus Henderson Investors UK Limited. Reg number 906355. Janus Henderson Fund Management UK Limited. Reg number 2678531. Henderson Equity Partners Limited. Reg number 2606646. Each registered in England and Wales at 201. Bishopsgate, London, EC2M 3AE and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and Janus Senderson Investors Europe S.A. Reg number B22848 at 2 Rue de Bitborg, L1273 Luxembourg and regulated by the Commission de Surveillance du Secteur Financier. Janus Senderson Knowledge Shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janus Henderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright Janus Henderson Group PLC. Net Asset Value, NAV, the total value of a fund's assets less its liabilities. Cyclical Stocks, companies that sell discretionary consumer items, such as cars, or industries highly sensitive to changes in the economy such as miners. The prices of equities and bonds issued by cyclical companies tend to be strongly affected by ups and downs in the overall economy, when compared to non-cyclical companies. Volatility. The rate and extent at which the price of a portfolio, security or index, moves up and down. If the price swings up and down with large movements, it has high volatility. If the price moves more slowly and to a lesser extent, it has lower volatility. Higher volatility means the higher the risk of the investment. Value investing. Value investors search for companies that they believe are undervalued by the market, and therefore expect their share price to increase. One of the favored techniques is to buy companies with low price to earnings (PE) ratios. See also growth investing. Growth investing. Growth investors search for companies they believe have strong growth potential. Their earnings are expected to grow at an above average rate compared to the rest of the market, and therefore there is an expectation that their share prices will increase in value. See also value investing. Yield. The level of income on a security, typically expressed as a percentage rate. For equities, a common measure is the dividend yield, which divides recent dividend payments for each share by the share price. For a bond, 
This is calculated as the coupon payment divided by the current bond price. Gearing. Gearing is the measure of a company's debt level. It is also the relationship between a company's leverage, showing how far its operations are funded by lenders versus shareholders. Within investment trusts it refers to how much money the trust borrows for investment purposes.